So welcome to the latest episode of The State of Mirrorless, our series of interviews with photographers and industry experts about the world of mirrorless cameras, hosted by the F-Stop Lounge. This week I have the pleasure to interview Gordon Lang of Cameralabs.com, who I recently met in person during a weekend spent shooting landscapes in Ireland. I learned there that Gordon is not only one of the most respected, respected technical reviewers out there, but also a very competent photographer on his own. So please join me in welcoming Gordon Lang. Grazie. Gordon. <laughs> Buongiorno. You're, you're welcome. <laughs> you, you're not only a photographer and a reviewer, you're also a good Italian speaker. <laughs> uh, yeah, good uh, knowledge of Italian. <laughs> Molto gentile. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, so, uh, we'd like to, to tell us a bit about uh, your life as a photographer and about uh, your, your website, cameralabs.com. How did it all start? Sure. Well, I've been into photography since I was a little kid. I think when I was about eight years old, which is going back quite a long time now, I used to borrow my father's 35mm SLR and I was desperate for one, but he forced me to go through various iterations of film cameras, disc cameras, 110 film cameras. But it really caught my imagination. I loved how photography teaches you to look at the world in a different way, it teaches you to pay more attention and to notice things that most people don't. They kind of walk along with their heads down, and that really drew me to photography. And I think that's a great thing also uh, to encourage kids to get into photography because it encourages them to look at things. And then as I got older, I was really into technical things, and that's when I also realized that photography is fantastic not just as an, as an artistic outlet, but also as a technical outlet. I mean, if you're interested in the technology behind cameras, there's just so much to learn, especially these days, so much to get your teeth into. So it became almost an inevitable career for me to actually start testing and reviewing hardware for a living. I started off on magazines in the early 90s, uh, reviewing cameras when they f the first digital cameras came out. And then gradually worked my way up the, the magazine ladder, then became freelance, then launched Camera Labs about eight to nine years ago simply because I wanted a platform to publish more and more detailed reviews. You see, in magazines, you typically only write 500 or 1,000 words for a review, whereas I wanted to write 10,000, 20,000 words, and nobody's going to publish that. It would take up a whole magazine, so the only place you can do that is on the Internet. So I thought, great, I'll publish my own reviews, see what happens, and after a couple of years, it became a full-time job. So I gave up the magazine work, and now I'm, I'm full-time on uh, CameraLabs.com. So if you're interested in in-depth reviews of stuff, that's where to head. So you, your reviews are quite uh, in-depth and, and, as you said, very long. Uh, how, how long does it take for you to, to write to a review from the moment, I, I guess, the manufacturer sends you some equipment for reviewing from the moment it's published? I guess it's a lot of work. It is. It's a massive amount of work. Um, when I'm reviewing, a, say, a compact point-and-shoot camera, I might try and turn that around in a week or 10 days. But when I'm doing a, a kind of higher-end camera, a camera that interests me personally, like a lot of the mirrorless cameras that I hope we'll be talking about later on, things like the Fujifilm X-T1 that I have, uh, I have here, uh, that would take me about a month to fully test and review that. And it really does become a, a work in progress, though, because once I've published that review, and that will be about already 20,000 words, which is pretty long, I will then add to it later on. So, for example, this weekend that we've just spent in Ireland, I did a lot of long exposure testing with the X-T1, and I've noticed some good things and also some bad things. So I'm going to be updating my review with a lot more detail for long exposure photographers. So the job never ends, but that's the beauty of the Internet. If you make any mistakes, you can correct them, and if you find out something new, you can add to that review. But I, I would like to say that just because they're long, hopefully they're not horrifically boring and dull. I always try and do a lot of real-life testing. I don't photograph charts. I find them boring as anything. You know, I, I take pictures of landscapes, so I, I use landscapes as test shots. So when you go to cameralabs.com, you'll see all of the test shots are hopefully attractive pictures. I, I live in Brighton in the south coast of England now, uh, but previous to that I was traveling the world. So the pictures you see are hopefully of interesting, colorful, places that you might be wanting to take pictures of as well. So hopefully it's more relevant, it's more fun. I hope so anyway. Yeah, what I like about Camera Labs, uh, when I personally, I'm a, I'm a fan of the site. Oh, well, thank you. Is, is that the, um, you, it's not just charts and diagrams and, and, and numbers, it's uh, real world usage. How Ooh. does that specific camera or lens uh, feels and, uh, and behave when you have it in your hands and you're using 
it, to shoot a, a real landscape or, or or other scenes instead of a, a test chart. And it's really important. The handling is one of the hardest things to test, but one of the most important things. I was having some very interesting conversations just this weekend with some photographers about their preferred cameras. And you know, the thing that came up was not how many frames per second did it shoot, uh, what resolution was the sensor, even what lenses were available. That wasn't the big issue. The big issue was where's the button that does the exposure bracketing? And does it do them in one go or does it do it in a sequence? Um, th things, little things like that, that, that certain photographers use every day and they become critically important. And it can make the difference between a camera that is an absolute joy to use and one that may perform well in tests, but actually is really difficult to use. So I try and look at all of these things. It, my impression is that, speaking of this particular topic that is usability and handling, that sometimes camera manufacturers don't seem to, to learn from past mistakes, and especially from mistakes of, made by others, like everybody coming out with a new series of cameras, they're like reinventing the wheel in terms of user interface. Even when some uh, some issues have already been solved years ago by Nikon or Canon or, or others. Do you, uh, do you yeah. feel the same? Yeah, completely. You look at some of the uh, ergonomics and the menus on, on these products and you think, what were they thinking of? I mean, obviously it's good to have your own ideas and to and to implement them, but like you say, there's no point reinventing the wheel, if somebody, especially the clicky control wheel. You know, even just things like that, clicky control wheels, some of them you'll notice on cameras, uh, the control wheel on the back, If you, uh, they, they can also be pushed up, down, left and right, as well as turned. Some of them, when you're turning them, they're very easy to push by mistake. Now, some cameras solve this, some cameras don't. And you think, well, I don't know, maybe there's some patents involved, but why can't they all use, you know, this problem has been solved, why can't we just all use the nice same clicky wheels and then move on to the next thing? But yeah, it's bizarre. You'll see this camera that has got amazing quality and speed and autofocus, but the most irritating little squashy buttons that just aren't tactile, they don't give feedback. So you do wonder sometimes what's going on, but that that's gives us something to talk about, doesn't it? It keeps me in business. <laughs> <laughs> sure. And how where do you see your, your business going with, with Camera Labs? Uh, do you see any... Big plans, Hugo. Big plans. Uh, well, speaking seriously, I'm gonna. I'm actually working on a big redesign at the moment that's going to implement a lot of things. I can't really talk about it at the moment. The problem is I'm a one-man operation. When you go to Camera Labs, you might think that there's a team of 5 or 10 or 20 people involved, like there are on some review websites, but with Camera Labs, it's just me. So. I think one of the things that I want to try and get across more so is that when you do read my reviews, you're actually talking to me at the time. You know, you, when you contact me on Facebook or Google Plus or Twitter or now on Ello or Instagram, um, you are talking to the person who does the reviews. Uh, but what that also means is that if I have to fix anything or redesign something, then the reviews have to stop. So it's very hard to time manage that. So I've got some big ideas, especially in the mobile space. That will hopefully happen, but I'm not going to give you any time scales because as soon as a more interesting camera comes along, I'm like, forget the redesign. I want to test this camera and get some sample images out as soon as possible. Yeah, so best of luck to you. Thank you. Camera Labs, it's a, it's a site that we all uh, we all need and love. Um, coming back to coming to another topic, uh, I mentioned the fact that we were uh, in Ireland together for for last last weekend for this uh, Donegal photo walk. Uh, was that was a great event. weekend, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a great weekend. It was weekend. a target-rich environment. Uh, we got a lot of uh, the organizers, Athena, John, and Andy, put us in front of some very, very nice things. Um, I'm really pleased with the pictures I got. Yeah, me too. Um, so you, you carried there, uh, I think, two or three cameras at least. You had the, the Fuji X-T1 that you mm -hmm. showed earlier. I think you had the Sony, was that the RX100? That's right, the latest, the Mark III, yes. And uh, what, why did you pick those cameras especially? And what do you like about them? What made you choose them for this specific trip? Well, a lot of it is actually kind of chosen for me in that they're the cameras that I'm testing at that time. I genuinely believe in order to do a, a very good review of something, you should use it all the time. You should make it your main camera at the moment. So the reason I had the RX100 Mark III with me is because I'm testing the Canon G7X at the moment, and those two are key rivals. So it's very important 
to not try and remember how a camera performed when you reviewed it a few weeks or months ago, but to actually get it again. This is one of the things I do that's different to a lot of reviewers. I'll actually get the rival camera in at the same time, and I'll take pictures with them both at the same time. So we were doing long exposure photography, which is quite challenging in the environment. Often it's dark, you know, when you're taking those pictures. And how a menu looks or how easily a control dial turns under those conditions is very important. So it's very worthwhile to test them next to each other. So that's why I had that Sony, although personally speaking, I own an RX100 Mark II and I think it's a superb compact camera. Sony really hits a sweet spot with this one inch sensor that they use there. It's not as big as APS-C or even Micro Four Thirds, so don't look for that in terms of quality, but it's a lot bigger than the one over 2.3 and even the one over 1.7 inch sensors that you get in most point and shoot. So it offers a big step up in quality, in noise and tonal dynamic range, in color. I really notice it in color. But also um, in terms of uh, depth of field. Now you're not going to be able to absolutely obliterate a background like you can on a larger format. But if you get close to something, you can get a nice blurry background. So you can have all of this in a body that's really quite small and portable, and that's what I really like about those. Uh, so I, was, I brought those along because I was testing them. I brought the X-T1 along because this is the camera that I'm going to be using for my personal work for the next, well, few weeks, hopefully next few months. I generally try and, after reviewing a system, and once, once we've all had a go of it, because they have limited loan stock, these companies, but once everyone's had a go at it, then you can sometimes go back to them and say, look, can I borrow this for a few extra weeks? I've got some interesting projects coming up. I'd really like to give it a give it a really in-depth uh, long-term test. And I did that with Micro Four Thirds for pretty much the past three years. I've been shooting almost exclusively with Micro Four Thirds. But I thought the time has come for me to really give Fuji X a turn because I think the image quality is fantastic. So I'm very excited to be using the X-T1 um, in Ireland where we were and also you know for the next few weeks maybe a bit longer. And what about handling? What about usability of those cameras? Do you see well, any space yeah. yeah, well there's 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 some massive differences between them. I mean what Fuji did, I think with the X series they've got a lot of technologies going on here. There's the sensor that has a very interesting architecture, produces absolutely beautiful pictures. The image processing, now a lot of people just shoot raw and then do the processing themselves, but I think they're missing a trick if they don't implement the film simulations that Fuji's got in these cameras because I think they produce absolutely superb JPEGs straight out of the camera. And the optics are also very good. So that whole imaging pipeline is pretty much sorted. I'm very satisfied with the image quality of this camera. Where it never used to perform well was in terms of autofocus speed. Now, they've improved that with each generation, and it's becoming better and better. But compared to, say, Micro Four Thirds, I'm used to shooting, say, with the Olympus OMD em one or the Panasonic GH4, or indeed any of their models. For single AF, they focus much faster and much better in very, very low light. So if you're taking pictures of kids or at parties and things, those cameras will perform. They feel much more responsive than this. I also feel that with the EM1, Olympus really nailed the control ergonomics. They've got big buttons, chunky dials. These are controls that you would feel very comfortable operating with gloves on when it's cold. But if you have a look at the X-T1, for example, look at these tiny little buttons it's got on the back, especially the, uh, the four cross keys. These are really very, very small, and they don't have much travel, as in when you push them, they don't go in much. I would really urge people to compare products like this with, say, the EM1 to see the difference in ergonomics and handling. So for me, the EM1 feels better, is nicer to use, but the X-T1 produces nicer image quality. So, but then the Micro Four Thirds has got smaller lenses. But then the X-T1's got a bigger viewfinder. But then, and it's just back and forth and back and forth. You know, the Olympus has built-in stabilization, which is fantastic. This doesn't have that, but this now has a decent continuous AF. I mean, that's a bizarre thing. The uh, single AF may not be very fast, but the continuous is very good. So really, when you're choosing between these cameras, you have to think very carefully about how you're going to use them. And hopefully that's where my reviews come in as well and, and help you make, make the right choice. But you have to think very carefully. Where am I going to use it? How am I going to use it? And most importantly, how am I finding my current setup limiting? Because when you talk to people about this, a lot of the times they just want to upgrade, but when you really drill down to it, the thing they're disappointed about may not be resolution, it may be focusing speed or the fact that when the light levels do go low and they're trying to take pictures of their kids or their friends, the thing is just going back and forth and back and forth and it's not locking on. Little things like that can actually be really big deal breakers. 
So there's a lot of difference between these. And of course, Sony's now come into the equation with full frame. A lot of people were rejecting mirrorless until this point because they say, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to touch it until it goes full frame. I personally think that's a red herring. I'd be happy to talk about, about that further. But at least the option's there now. Yeah. Um, since you mentioned the autofocus speed, you, you didn't bring to, to Ireland your... I think you used the A6000, the Sony, when you followed the Tour de France recently. That's right. That's right. Now, continuous, continuous AF is always something that's been a challenge with 100% electronic live view systems. This is the thing that DSLRs solved very early on because they inherited this AF system from film SLRs where the light bounces off the, the mirror, goes up into the viewfinder, and a bit of that is redirected to a phase detect AF system that's very fast and, then more importantly, knows what direction to turn in. So, that, so it's already got a head start and it can also employ prediction. So this phase detect technology it has allowed DSLRs to be great for sports photography. And of course, by removing that optical path on a mirrorless camera, they didn't have it. They have contrast-based AF that is very accurate, but it is slow. It involves hunting beyond the subject and then going back, going, whoa, I've, I've gone too far, and then, whoa, I've gone too far again. Oh, I've gone too far again. And it goes back and forth, and eventually it nails it. And when it nails it, it's perfect. But it takes time. Fine for landscapes, fine for buildings, terrible for sport. So what the manufacturers have been doing, they think we've got to find a solution to this because we can't just put an optical viewfinder back in one of these. Well, Fujifilm do on some of theirs, don't they? They have a bit of fun with that, but most people don't. So what they've realized is that they could actually embed phase detect AF points onto the actual imaging sensor itself. And this allows them to do much better continuous AF than before. Now, the X-T1 has a bunch of these in the middle of the sensor. And so long as your subject's in the middle of the frame, it actually does a, a pretty good job at tracking it continuously. But what Sony did with the A6000 is they covered the whole frame with them. So regardless of where the subject is, not, not just in the middle. And if you remember, DSLRs, it has to be within that little magic diamond in the middle, doesn't it? Outside of that, mm -hmm. it's not going to do anything. But Sony say, no, it doesn't matter. Across the whole frame, we're going to put these phase detect points. And you know what? It really works. I first of all tested it with you know, a normal kit zoom. Now, that's not got a very long focal length or a bright aperture, so it's not a tough test. But then I got a hold of the Sony 70 to 200 FE lens. So that's a full frame lens, but on APS-C it becomes 300 mil. It's f4, so it's not super bright, but 300 millimeter f4 is still a challenge to focus, especially on a moving subject. But it just works. And I took it to the Tour de France. Uh, I, I did five stages in, uh, in France and one stage in England. And it just worked. I mean, I was used to getting a hit rate of, I don't know, 30%, 25% for sports. I was getting about 90%, 95% hit rate. That means in, in a perfectly focused shot. And this is of cyclists approaching me downhill sometimes at speeds up to 80 kilometers an hour, maybe even faster sometimes. I mean, they are going super fast. And it just worked. I was very, very impressed with that. Um, now, the irony is the A6000 to me is a horrible camera to use because the buttons are nasty, they're not in the right place, the viewfinder I don't like, um, I can't hold the camera properly, I don't enjoy using it, but technologically speaking, it works. And for that job, it works better than anything else. And the thing I really love about Sony, okay, they don't have that photographic heritage of, say, Canon and Nikon, so sometimes their ergonomics aren't quite as good. Hopefully that will improve. But what they have got is a lot of technology, and they also have a fantastic attitude, which is if we've got a great technology that works, like this continuous AF on the A6000, let's not hold it back. Let's put it in everything going forward. So already it's been deployed in the A5100, which is a, a budget mirrorless camera. Okay, it doesn't shoot as fast, but it still does that autofocus. You know, if this was Canon, they had a similar technology with 70D. Absolutely fantastic. So what did they do with it? Nothing. Nothing at all. They sat on it until the 7D Mark II came out just recently, and that's the, only the second camera to have it, and that was over a year, maybe longer, between them. That technology should be in every one of their cameras, and that's what I like about Sony. When they get something good, let's just put it in everything. Why not? Very much interesting. Now, speaking of sports, my usual co-host, Andre Apple, who unfortunately is not with us today, I recently went to Photokina. I, I know you went there, yes. too. And he was very impressed with the, at least with the specification of the new uh, Samsung uh, NX1, mm -hmm. uh, especially for uh, for sports, uh, 15 frames per second, mm -hmm. fast zooms, uh, 
and he said there was some uh, great autofocus capabilities. Do you have any um, opinions about that camera? Yeah, very much. I was also at Photokina, as you said, and I played with the NX1. Now, of course, they're, they're pre-production. None of us have tried a final production sample yet, or, or let alone outside of the, uh, the Messe halls in Cologne. So it's impossible to say how well it performs, but certainly in terms of specification, they've pulled out all the stops. I mean, Samsung, what normally happens when you design a camera is you have a list of things, and you think, oh, we'll have that, we'll have two of those. We won't do that because it's not appropriate, and oh, we, we can't do that, so we won't bother. What Samsung have done is they've got hold of this list, and they've gone, put it all in. Let's have everything. Just have it all. Put it all in. And it's insane because, I mean, like you say, I mean, it's got a, so it's got a new APS-C sensor, and of course, it also has the embedded face detect AF point, so hopefully, it should track. It has a, a fully articulated screen that's, of course, touch sensitive, a big OLED viewfinder, 15 frames per second, um, 4K video, of course. Um, oh, it's got everything. Oh, in terms of wireless, I mean, it's got 802.11 AC and Bluetooth. Why not? They've got the chipset. Let's just throw it in there. Let's have everything in there. So, in terms of spec. It's got everything. You couldn't want a better camera, and it's affordably priced. But, first of all, not only how well does it perform in practice, but how well does it handle? Again, Samsung are quite new to the kind of photography game, and they are not as experienced as, again, Canon, Nikon, and those guys, Olympus, in terms of ergonomics. It might not be a nice camera to use. You might think, wow, this has got the best specification in the world, but once it's in your hands, maybe the buttons aren't right, maybe it doesn't feel right, maybe there's some odd things that just wouldn't occur to an electronics manufacturer that would definitely occur to a camera manufacturer. So, I mean, I'm obviously reserving judgment until I've got a final production sample and I'm testing it, because it may well be the best camera in the world. The other question, though, is it's another mirrorless format. I mean, obviously, the NX format's not brand new. Uh, they've, they've had a few bodies, but... There's just so many of them, and I, I wonder the target audience for it probably already have an existing system, and they're going to think, oh, I'm going to have to invest in new lenses again. I'm going to have to, you know, it's, it's another mount, it's another system, and I'm not sure there's, I'm not sure there's room for it. But in terms of specification, it's very impressive. I should also give you, a, I'll give a quick advert. I've just produced a, a really long video about um, Photokina that goes over about 20 of my favorite products. So if you're interested in, in that, just check check out, uh, search for me on YouTube and you'll find that. And I've talked about the NX1 and, and all of the other products that were announced there. So the days of uh, Nikon and, and Canon in the sports arena are not counted yet, but I think that maybe they should well, be worried. I think they should definitely be worried, but not in the sports arena. The interesting thing is that if you do go to a sporting event, I mean, sometimes as a, as a member of the press, we get invited to various stadiums and things, and you stand alongside the guys, and they are invariably guys who are doing the sports photography. And basically, if you don't have a Canon or a Nikon, you're ostracized from that group. They're like, who do you think you are with your little mirrorless camera? Get out of here. We're not taking you seriously. And it's just, there's it a choice of two, that's it, Canon or Nikon. And because they've been doing it for so long, and these guys have invested a lot of money in some that, you know, if you're buying a 600mm f4 lens, you don't want to change systems very often. That's a big investment. And they've, Canon and Nikon have rewarded that commitment with, um, with a lot of effort into the autofocusing, into the, the speed at which these cameras operate, but also in terms of their build quality. Now, a lot of people have said to me, yo, I'm not buying mirrorless until it reaches this spec. Technically, they've reached that spec, but now the one thing that's really missing is that ultimate build quality. There is no mirrorless camera that is built as confidently as a Canon 1DX or a Nikon D4. Those are cameras where you could, if somebody attacks you, you could hit them over the head with it and <laughs> do them a serious amount of damage. You could drop that camera and you'd be concerned for the floor, you know, not, not for the gear. There is no mirrorless camera that is that tough yet. And for those people who, and then when you talk to them, they'll say, look, you know, I get hit by basketballs and footballs coming at me at whatever speed all the time, and when they hit your camera, they're going to really smash it. It's literally going to destroy your camera, so they need something very, very tough. And sadly, that does not exist in the mirrorless space yet. And when you talk to the mirrorless companies about this, they go, well, we haven't... I'm not going to speak for all of them, just some of them. The ones that have said this have said they have no desire to compete with Canon and Nikon on that. There's no point. They're already so established and they're doing it so well, there's no point in trying to compete with that. However, for everything else, it's game on. And I would say that is where Canon and Nikon are falling behind. They're still doing brilliantly for sports, and they will always do brilliantly for sports, but I wonder if in the future they'll become 
a lens manufacturer with a niche sports body business. Because frankly speaking, I think you'd agree you go that I think in terms of the mainstream and even for enthusiasts that you know the sort of stuff that we do, I think mirrorless is already more than satisfactory and in, in many ways superior to using a DSLR. Yeah, it is for me at least, but I'm, I'm not a pro and I, I don't shoot sports. So exactly. I'm pretty yeah. much satisfied. Um, I, I'm a Fuji user like you, and well, you, you use pretty much a bit of everything, but I'm mm. uh, now committed to Fuji. Uh, so for Photokina, they, they came out with um, some upgrades a new DX30 new model, mm -hmm. uh, new versions of the X100S, now the X100T, mm -hmm. or the X-T1 Graphite. That's right. Which oh, looks very tasty, actually, in person. When you see photos of it, it doesn't do it justice. You go, oh, it's just silver. It's another silver camera. But it's not. It's more gunmetal gray, and it is quite it is quite classy. I mean, they were quite wordy with their description of it, but I think it justifies it. When you see it in person, you're like, ooh, this is, this is quite nice. I still prefer the black one myself. But. Mm -hmm. uh, doesn't it look like they are, they have no nothing really new to show, and they came up with a, a new color for an existing camera and a new firmware just to justify the the fact that they would be able to announce something new? Or are they a bit lagging behind at the moment? Well, that that could even be seen as a trend because Olympus did exactly the same thing. They they used Photokina to launch a silver version of the EM1, also with a firmware update which also provides it with USB tethering. So there, there, that seemed to be a bit of a theme between those two companies. I think when you look at camera companies, they develop at a slower speed. And the bodies, you wouldn't normally upgrade your body as frequently as you would your consumer electronics. But the photography industry has been invaded by consumer electronics companies like Sony and Panasonic and Samsung, and they're, they're pushing at a much faster speed. They're bringing out cameras maybe not even every year, sometimes even every six months. And, and because we're getting used to that speed of development, I think some of the more traditional companies, especially Canon and Nikon, would appear to be developing slowly. I, I don't think they are developing slowly. They're just developing slower than those other guys. This does mean they are being left behind on electronic technology. For example, 4K video is now a year old for Sony and Panasonic, whereas Canon and Nikon still haven't got it on any of their consumer products. Um, so I think at first it's inevitable to be disappointed that there was no new X series body, that there was no new OMD. But you know what? It's only these cameras are only a year old. And Olympus in their presentation were very keen to say, look, you know, we think when you in, when you invest, when you invest in a product like this, you want it to have a longer shelf life. You don't want to see the new one come out a year later uh, with all these new features. So instead they said, what we're going to do is we're going to improve the firmware. We're going to give you new features, which is really nice. Of course, that may be hiding the fact that they've fallen behind. I don't know. You can look at it either way. But if you're an existing owner of an X-T1 or an EM1, it's nice that as of now, you can extend its capabilities with a free update. Yeah, I think that the people who are mostly disappointed were the uh, the owners of the X Pro One. Oh, that's never going to happen, Hugo. Is it's never going to happen? No, I X Pro Two so. is never going to happen. So. There's so many. It's yeah. like the Nikon D400. It's never going to happen. It probably will happen in a month now. Um, I don't. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, no, I should say I don't have any secret advanced information, and if I did, I wouldn't be allowed to tell you. But actually, I don't have any secret advanced information from Fuji, so they may well be working on the X Pro 2. But to be honest, I think this is the X Pro 2, the X T1. That's that's the successor. I mean, I, I don't know. A lot of people really like the X Pro 1. They really like the viewfinder. A lot of people handling. like the like the the optical viewfinder on Brow. I've seen the electronic viewfinder of the X-T1, and I don't see the need for an optical viewfinder. No, no. I mean, when I tested the X-Pro1, I was amazed by the technology behind it. I thought it was fantastic, so innovative, so clever, but ultimately, I, I didn't get on with it. I preferred the electronic viewfinder in the X-T1, which is the best one on the market. You know, I mean, the EM1's got a fantastic EVF, but the X-T1 is even better which is amazing that, that they've done that. One of the things Fuji have done that no one else has done, This I love this about this camera, is that when you turn it on its side, and I shoot almost everything in the portrait orientation, when you turn it on its side, the information also turns around. So the, the shutter speed and the aperture, they, they turn around, so they're the right way up. Why hasn't anyone else thought of that? I mean, that's, that's, that, that sort of thing is really, really useful. 
um, they chose their thinking about exploiting the what the technology lets you do. So I think they're, they're thinking in, in some really clever ways. But yeah, there may be an X-Pro2. I'm not waiting for it. I, and what they certainly did tell us is they showed us some new lenses uh, that they're working on. And, you know, the, the X series of lenses, there's some really tasty, tasty things going on there. So that, that system's looking stronger and stronger. And that's something Sony has to keep an eye on because they've gone a bit body, body mad recently. I mean, there's three different versions of their full frame A7. 12, 24, and 36 megapixels. I mean, that's lovely, but don't forget you've got to put a lens on the end of it. It's okay to adapt things from time to time, but we need native lenses. So in their presentation, they were very keen to say, oh, look, we are we are planning new lenses. There are going to be more lenses. And they also finally showed their 16 to 35, the Zeiss Ultra Wide Zoom that everyone's been waiting for. Fingers crossed, it's a really good lens. You know, if that lens performs well, Sony are going to have a fantastic Christmas and beyond because that's the lens everyone's waiting for. Everyone who's got an A7R, they're all adapting Nikon 14 to 24s or Canon 16 to 35s or even the Sony's own 16 35 for the A mount. If they nail it with this native lens, then that will that will be a really nice system. Okay. By, by the way, you made me, you and the other guys that were in Ireland, you made me buy the. 1024 the full <laughs> Yeah, I heard that. I heard you were. It was peer pressure. Peer pressure, wasn't it? Well, it's peer such pressure a, and a and a good offer on on Amazon. So. Yeah, I saw that you got a good deal on that, didn't you? Um, it's a fantastic lens. I'm testing it at the moment. I'm very happy with it, but I'm going to be doing a very in-depth test at it. So look out for that at Camera Labs. But it's a really nice range. I mean, I was shooting previously with the Lumix 7 to 14. For micro four thirds, that's a very very sharp lens. Everything on micro four thirds is reduced by two, so it becomes 14 to 28. That's great at the wide end, but at the longer end, 28 is still quite wide. The nice thing about the Fuji 10 to 24, with a 1.5 reduction, is 24 becomes 36. 36 is quite a lot longer than uh, 28, and it makes it a much more of a much more of an all-round lens. And I was quite surprised to find that. I rarely took it off on that weekend of landscape photography. It, it, it was I could have actually just travelled with that one lens. So it, it feels to me more versatile than, than the Lumix, which is a really needs a 35 to go with it. Yeah, definitely. So any other trends or products that we should we should keep our eyes focused on? Well, I think. Future? I think that if you're holding back on buying mirrorless, you really have to ask why. I mean, obviously, if you've got a perfectly serviceable camera at the moment, there's no need to upgrade. Just enjoy it and take pictures with it. But a lot of people say, oh, I'm waiting for this to happen. And, and if you are, I'd sort of say, well, what are you waiting for? There's already full frame from Sony. There's already fast, continuous autofocus for sports from Sony. There's fantastic uh, image quality, optics, and, and, and handling from things like the X-T1. The EM1 is such a great street shooter and portrait camera because it's got all these fantastic primes and they all become stabilized and it focuses so fast. Panasonic have got 4K video in the GH4 which is a lovely camera. You know, there's so many systems out there that already deliver everything, everything that you could want apart from a bulletproof camera, that's the one thing. And you've got to ask yourself, you know, are you a photographer that needs a bulletproof camera? Personally speaking, I'm not. I know there are some people who do and they uh, will have to stay with their DSLRs for the time being, but I think it's a, it's a fantastic time for mirrorless. And there's a lot of benefits to shooting electronically. Uh, first of all, there's no real limit to how big that viewfinder can be. I mean, you look through the X-T1, that's a bigger view than a full-frame DSLR. And of course, you can the, the optical fanatics will say, ah, oh, yes, but um, when it gets dark, they have to turn up the amplifier and it becomes noisy. And so, yeah, sure it does, but you get to overlay all that information, you know, histograms, guidelines. You get to shoot movies through it, which you can't with an optical viewfinder. You can do focus peaking. Focus peaking is brilliant. I love focus peaking, especially when you're adapting other lenses, manual focus lenses. So fast to focus that, especially for movies, track, um, uh, racking focus from near to far or vice versa. As soon as you see that little ready break, Jedi Knight halo around your subject, you know it's in focus. So many good things about it. And also being able to implement stuff like face detection and scene detection. Now, on the DSLRs, they've got really good RGB metering sensors now that can, they've got, they're so sophisticated, they can actually do a bit of face detection now on the DSLR, even through the optical viewfinder. But it still doesn't work as well as it does on a 100% native live view system. And when you're shooting portraits or pictures of kids running around, it just works so well. 
and I, I have no. And then there's the size benefit, which is the thing that people would always thought was the only benefit of mirrorless. It's not for me. The benefit of mirrorless is the live view composition. For some, they might think it's for people who've not used it. They might see that as the downside. It's not. That is the big plus side for me. Seeing exactly what you're going to get, applying effects, using guides and and help. I love it. I'm a convert. I'm a, I, was a, I was a believer from the start, Ugo. I, I, I got into this with the first Micro Four Thirds bodies all those years ago, and I was like, this is it. This is, this is the system for me. It's, it's just, it just works the way I work. Very well. So anything else you, you want to add? That's, that's it, really. I mean, I would, I would say if you are looking to get a new camera, think very carefully about what it is that you want from it and how your current system is letting you down. Look at the lenses that you want, and also if you have any friends you want to borrow them from, like the weekend we've just been on, a lot of Fuji shooters, and um, a lot of them running off with my 56mm f1.2. <laughs> you know, it's nice to be able to exchange stuff. That can be a, that could be a deal maker or breaker for you, being able to borrow stuff from other people. And again, in my reviews, I try and go over a lot of these things that other reviewers don't, who just say concentrate on the image quality. I'll look a lot at the other things as well. So if you think, well, no, actually, I want to take pictures of my kids running about in the park, then that's the sort of thing which is actually a big challenge for most cameras, and I'll be able to help you choose the right one for that. In fact, I'll tell you right now, it's only A6000. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, it's, uh, it's, so, it's so impressive for continuous shooting and action. It just works. And it shoots at 10 frames per second, which means that if you're getting a 90% hit rate, that means you're getting nine good pictures every second. Nine every second. So if you're looking for that shot where somebody's got their eyes open and they're smiling and they're coming towards you like this, you don't have like just one to choose from. You've got nine to choose from. You will get the decisive moment. Oh, here's another thing to look out for. Speaking of decisive moment, 4K video. You might think, all these cameras come out with 4K video. Do I need 4K video? Because I don't have a 4K TV and there's no 4K broadcasts and there's no 4K DVDs, not many streaming services. The content is limited. Well, 4K has got two really cool things uh, about it, and they're all to do with the resolution of, of that frame. It's actually got 8 megapixels worth of information on it, which means when you take video grabs from it, you're grabbing 8 megapixel stills. But, of course, the camera is capturing them at a video rate of 25 to 30 frames per second. So when you look at your sports camera shooting at 10, or we're getting excited about the Samsung NX1 shooting at 15, oh, forget about that. How about shooting at 25 or 30 frames per second? Sure, it's only 8 megapixels, but 8 is still pretty good. And Panasonic have now got software in the GH4, the LX100, and FZ1000 that lets you go through it a frame at a time and export a JPEG all in camera. You don't even need to use a computer or a phone to do this. It does it all in camera. The other thing you can do if you're filming a 1080p project is, of course, there's so much detail in a 4K frame that you can actually crop it and still end up with a perfect 1080p frame. And what that means is that you can actually move it around the frame. You can pretend to pan across the frame. You can zoom in and zoom back out again and still have a full 1080p's worth of information. So 4K, I think, is very, very, very useful. And I think we're going to see a, a lot of photography go down that way. And believe it or not, a lot of magazines, even high-end fashion magazines, are using video for a lot of their shoots. You may think you're looking at a still photo, but you're actually looking at a grab from video. And of course, that's great because you've already got your behind-the-scenes footage filmed, haven't you? And mm -hmm. you know, if your model just slightly blinks or looks a bit funny, it's okay because that's just one of 30 frames a second. It's a very interesting technology, and we're going to see that get higher resolution. Red uh, Digital Cinema showed uh, 6K at Photokina with 19 megapixel stills from that, and because it's filming in RAW, those are RAW stills is exporting. And Panasonic talked about the 2020 Tokyo Olympics, where they'll be filming broadcasting in 8K, which lets you, I think, grab 33 megapixel stills. And I bet at that point, it won't be 30 frames per second. It'll probably be 60 frames a second. So a lot of photographers are at fear. Traditional or conservative photographers fear the future technologies. They're like, oh, we, we don't want video, or we don't want this. Or these are the same people who said they didn't want autofocus or you know, auto exposure. I'd say don't fear it, embrace it. And uh, video, especially 4K video, th this could really be a game changer in the future. So I would definitely, if it excites you, look for it in your future camera. Yeah, I also heard somebody say that, in, and it resonated with me, that you might not be able to really broadcast or 
make the best use of 4K video, but it's like future-proofing your videos. Hmm. You're shooting them now, and maybe in a, in a few years, you'll be able to, to exploit 4K resolution for normal broadcasting. Exactly, and this is an area where Panasonic and so Sony, and especially Panasonic, are really taking a lead. And I think if it's a technology that does take off in the mainstream, then Canon and Nikon are going to look a bit old-fashioned very, very quickly. And they, they'll have to watch out because, you know, lest we forget, Canon kind of drove this whole video on cameras with the 5D Mark II. They, uh, they brought it out on that 1080p on the 5D Mark II. None of us knew what to do with it. Why, why has it got video? What's the point? And they went, no, 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 you'll wait and see. We, you'll realize we were right. And they were, and then they did the 5D Mark III that all videographers bought, and it was a fantastic camera. And they've not really done anything since in the consumer space. Now, they've got their EOS cinema cameras, but they're very expensive. They're, they're proper movie makers. I'm talking about the, the DSLRs. And now when you talk to them, it's like they're responding. They're reacting rather than uh, innovating and leading. They used to lead, but now they're waiting and seeing, which I think is a very cautious and perhaps dangerous approach in this market because they're letting their rivals catch up and overtake them. Great. So I think this, this was an awesome conversation and a, a treasure trove of information <laughs> and <laughs> inputs for our listeners to, and viewers to, to digest and, and think about what they want to do with their, with their systems. And I'm very happy to talk further ago as well. If anybody wants to contact me, I, I'm pretty active on the social networks. Follow me on Google Plus and Facebook. I'm Gordon Lang on those. I'm Camera Labs on Twitter and Instagram. So please feel free to contact me on any of the networks and have a chat. Uh, you know me, Hugo. I, do, I can go on about this stuff all the time. I do go on about this stuff all the time. I love it. It's uh, <laughs> it's my job, but it's also my passion. I, I adore it. Yeah, it, it shows. I mean, it really shows the, the passion that you that you put in all of this. So, That's it. thank you again for, for being with us uh, today, and let's keep in touch. Definitely. Thank you very much for having me.